The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. God is basically, uh, I I just see him kind of like Ezekiel's army. All of a sudden he's speaking to dry bones, but they're coming together. And I'm seeing the framework coming together. And I I do think right now it's a season where the house groups are going to be a significant part of that. So we'll just watch and see what God is doing relationally. But the topic that doesn't seem to leave is the topic of vision. So we've already had three messages on why vision. All right, and without a vision, the people perish. Without a vision, the people cast off restraint. But I really feel in this day and age, it's, it's incumbent upon me to make a clear distinction between your likes, your dislikes, your dreams, your wants, and your needs, and that which was planned for you before you were formed in your mother's womb. It's a big difference. Because many people have been shipwrecked, and it wasn't even God's dream for them. It was... Uh, a, a dream of their own making, what they thought they'd like. The sad part is those dreams are usually made out of things that you are already gifted or have an inclination toward. That's a good thing. But that inclination and that gifting needs to be brought forth by the Lord according to His protocol, not according to the way you would see them implemented. Right? You can, you can have a dream and a vision for something like, uh, I often see um, I, I like to use my dad as an example. Uh, he got saved late in life, but he, he would have volunteered for free without pay to be a greeter at Walmart. He loved people that much. Had he developed, really, the gift and the calling, I could have seen a quality evangelist. He could have taken on the form even in the business uh, sector and everything. He, he would have just been a wonderful mouthpiece for the Lord. But it was his natural tendency. So some of your natural tendencies is what people make their dreams out of. There's unsaved people that are successful, are they not? Unsaved people that are successful? But not necessarily is that the plan and the purpose that God had for their life. So don't confuse destiny with success. That's a major, major area. But I believe God wants to start to build. So today we're going to build on the vision. And I believe that, that when God builds on a vision, uh, He is the Alpha and the Omega. That means He is the initiator of the vision, and He is the one that brings it to pass. That's a little different than the way some people look at their vision or their dream. Right? If you look at the end of your dream and you see you, you're in trouble. Because He's the Alpha and the Omega. And in a larger sense, the one that applies to absolutely everybody, is that the eternal purpose of God was that you would bring many sons to glory. Gee, that's kind of others-oriented, isn't it? That you would bring others' sons unto glory as a purpose or a motivation. So if your motivation ends with, it's all about me, you probably have distorted something that was legitimate in the first place. So I want to believe to start building the vision for your life. I want to say that uh, here's, here's the vision that God gave me. I didn't pick it. That's how you know it's a God vision. But he showed me how to plant a church, but first how to, how to build and let him build in my life before I built a congregation. Right? And it was according to a pattern based on principles. And so it's kind of like, he says, there's no other foundation other than Jesus the Word. And you agree with that from a scriptural point of view. There's no other foundation other than Him and intimacy with Him. And he's basically saying that here's the three patterns and principles. If you're you're a note taker, you just jot these down. Because God builds everything according to a pattern based on a principle. Everything in your Bible is according to a pattern based on a principle, and Jesus is the prince 
of the principle. You don't just worship the principle, you worship the prince of the principle. Now, the first thing that Jesus said is there can be no other foundation other than he himself. And when he gave me the vision for how to let him build in my life, he gave me a pattern that was so generic it could apply to everybody and anybody. That generic. Specificity comes as you obey. You want to know what your specific plan and purpose is. That's what everybody usually jumps to that. And then they fabricate their own ideas of what that is. But if you would obey the generic basic principles and walk in obedience to that organically, it would just begin to blossom. And your gifts and your talents will be included in there, but they will be used in a way that maybe you'd have never, maybe, for sure you'd have never come up with on your own. Otherwise you wouldn't need him. He said, for I know the plans that I have for you. Who knows the plans that I have for you? God. You're going to have to get them from him. Unsaved people don't know what it is. Unspiritual people don't usually even seek God to know what it is. So you can be a religious person and never really fulfill your destiny. But destiny always includes success and satisfaction. That's how you can tell when you know that you know I wouldn't do anything else. Live and breathe what we do, right, Jennifer? And I mean, there's a place of satisfaction then that is so fulfilling in you that satisfaction is everything in you from the anointing perspective wants to reciprocate and satisfy the heart of God. That's not dead works because it's already coming from the satisfaction that you have. We love because He first loved us. If He doesn't first love us and you don't have that awareness, you, what you give is out of the carnality. But if you give out of the overflow, out of the overflow it's coming from a place that I found the satisfaction in the plans and the purposes of God. And now out of that plan and purpose I give. And as He is to us, so are we in the world. As He is to us. In other words, that measure of reality you have of Him in your relationship with Him is what He is in the world through you. And only that much. So, here's the three principles. I keep saying, get your pens out, and you've been waiting for the three, and I go on and on and on. All right? This is, this is for me, this is life. This is, this is breathing. This is reality to me. It might sound a little heady, but it's not heady. It's actually relational. It's spiritual, and it's real for me. The three words that he's given is basically the Word, and there's no other foundation other than the Word, and he won't lead you contrary to that Word. I'm talking the written Word, but yes, Jesus is the Word, so it's a person. The will, the Word, the will, and the way, all right? The Word is both the closed canon of Scripture and secondly, the person of the Lord Jesus Himself, God Himself. He is the Word, the living Word. The Word, the will, what's His will? This is hard for believers to do because we've, we've been raised in a country even that, that really promotes uh, personal freedom and rugged individualism. But in reality, the will of God is for oneness. And I had to die to a lot of my flesh because I was raised in South Chicago and independence was maturity. That's the way it translated. I told that story many times. When I was nine years old, I would ask my dad to give me money for my shoes. I wanted to go in the shoe store alone because at age nine, I didn't want my friends to think that my dad had to go with me to buy shoes. In city life, that was maturity. Independence was maturity. But what you can stop there, and many in the church, regardless of your chronological age, you can stop there. Real maturity is when you can become not only independent and you're not needy, you can stand on your own two feet, but you're healthy enough to become interdependent. And that's a transition many people don't make. Because for them, that's a sign of weakness. No, it's a sign of wisdom and strength. If one can chase a thousand, two, ten thousand. All right, there's, a, there's an exponential factor in the ability to be interdependent. You do not lose your individual identity, but you gain something that you can never get by yourself. You begin to live in something that is larger than yourself. 
Husbands when you, and wives, when you first get married, you don't lose your individuality, but nonetheless, when the two become one, they enter into a new creation, something that never existed before. They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with Him, but when two people come together and they're joined together, there's a new creation developed. And when you have children, these are the offspring. There is a whole new entity that is being developed and it's corporate. And so the sooner you learn that independence is not maturity by itself, interdependence is a sign of maturity. And so there's the Word, and the Word is both your Bible, and the Word is both the person of the Lord Jesus. And we'll get to that. The second one is His will. His will is for oneness. That pattern goes throughout the Bible, oneness. You could answer a lot of your own questions by saying, this thing that I'm struggling with, does it produce oneness? Oneness with God and each other. Hmm? Oneness. Yeah, oneness with God and with each other. Does it produce that? Because there's a lot of people trying to be successful, but they use people to get there. That didn't produce oneness. All right? Might be called success in the world, but that's not real success. Destiny will include other people. And out of that union and communion, your purpose and your, your, your success will flow. The Word. His will. And His will is always oneness. His way is always holy love. And in the world, we have to say holy love because it's infiltrated the church so much that there's a form of love that's basically loves sin, loves everything. All right? And holy love is the distinctive quality of the way God operates and the only way God operates. He does not operate in a love that's not holy. And this is where the mothers can get upset. But the most beautiful thing that we have in a world is mother love. It's a picture in and of itself. But mother love, if that's the best the world has to offer, is still selfish. Matter of fact, I really believe God used family and sending His Son as a demonstration of that love toward us. Huh. Because everybody can love their child. They can even, but would you give your child for other people? Mm -hmm. And technically, a small part of that existed today in, in uh, Josiah's dedication. It's a big deal when a mother and a father realize for this reason a man must leave his mother and father and cling unto his wife. There is a release that is absolutely necessary. And it's not easy. Because there's a tendency to say, I own them. And the tendency is, no, you are a steward. And there is a time that release allows them to become a new entity and fulfill the purpose that God had planned for them before the foundation of the earth. So parents, let this be a warning, especially on a day when we have baby dedication. You don't live your life through those children. Those children have a call on their life, a unique call. Poor Jennifer, I, when we got married, I had to pray her through all kinds of ministry because her dad gave her two choices. You can be a lawyer or you can be a doctor. And the little rebel said, I am doing neither one. <laughs> But after she dealt with the bad attitude, <laughs> she found the plan and the purpose that God had for her life. And quite frankly, it didn't involve either one. So you can have all the good intentions of the world, but in reality you should want the best for them individually, to be all that they can be in the sight of God, whether it's something you would have picked or not. We saw that Hallmark movie, remember, where that, where, where that guy was a male nurse. And the family didn't like him because what's a man doing being a nurse? Kind of an attitude. Until that prejudice was broken. What's the difference? You marry a man, you marry a woman for their unique quality and individuality, not their vocation. That doesn't define them. His way is always always holy love selfless pure and it's focused for others so we we'll go back to vision 
three weeks on vision, this is the fourth week on vision, and by golly, we're still on the same thing. If, you, if the vision is from God, it starts with God, it ends with God. If at the end of what you call a vision, you don't see God, you just see you, then you've got in there and you've distorted it somehow. All the years in ministry, uh, the ache in my heart for people who would say, Pastor, I've got a vision uh, to, be, uh, to have a house on the beach and, and help people. But they wanted the house on the beach more than they wanted to help people because they did nothing in, in the way of training to help people. All their efforts were applied in getting the house on the beach. And so don't put God into it. That's an insult. You dishonor Him. And the sad part is, in one particular case, I noticed where they got the house on the beach and they couldn't find a church and they couldn't find friends and they couldn't find a relationship. And it was kind of like, duh. <laughs> you put you before God. And that's the end result. That's what happens. Not that he can't fix it, because there's one thing about our God. He is wise enough and smart enough to fix it. <laughs> so you can crash and burn. Bury that concept of what you thought was your dream. Give it a funeral and then say, God, resurrect it. Let me dream again. Reveal to me the plans and the purposes you have for me, even at this stage. It's never too late. He's that smart. He can fix it. His word, his will, and his way. And his way is always love. And I can remember... And I'm going to have Jennifer teach on some of this uh, one of these days on how God develops this vision. But let's start with the first place, the first, the first level of the vision. When God says, start with you, Dennis, before you plant a church, you start with you, I want intimacy. And here's what he required of me. So I think it's generic. You do it what you want. It might sound too hard, but for me... It was a clear word from God. Basically used Isaiah 66, verse 2, where it said, But this is the man that I'm going to look upon, him who is of a poor, poor and of a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. And there were four qualifications that spoke to me, and I'm talking over a period of years just based on here's the one that I'm going to look upon. If God has, knows the plans that he has for me, plans for welfare, not calamity, to give me a future and a hope, then I will find them if I seek them, right? If you seek me, you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And when I started the searching process to find out, you know, God, what do you, what do you have for me? The first thing he did was basically, he says, first of all, a humble and a contrite heart is holding the heart open to whatever God has, and my likes and my dislikes have to just go by the wayside. And when I did that and I, I opened up, God basically says, what I'm looking for, a broken and a contrite heart, is basically element number one, easy to contact you spirit to spirit. I'm going to give you four elements and this is only the foundation. The foundation of the vision was, I want you to be easy to contact. In other words, I don't want you to have to hit you with a board. <laughs> I would rather guide you with my eye. <laughs> my mother could do it. Why couldn't God do it? My mother had a look. I knew what she meant. Jennifer's got a look. I always got a kick out of it. Jennifer can nod her head like a yes, and she's telling me no. She's gone. And here's how she does it. She goes, ah. That means, Dennis, don't do it. Right? Someone else might need a border along the side of the head, but not me. I don't, my, and my mother would go. And if the look didn't work, usually words will correct. Dennis Lee. Whoa, the middle name. All right? That's another sign. Okay. But here's, here's what God was saying. I want someone that is easily able to contact me spirit to spirit because God is spirit. 
900 times in our Bible the word spirit or spirits is used. So God did not want an intellectual life with me. He wanted a spirit to spirit. So element number one is I want to be able to contact you easily by the spirit. Heart to heart, breath to breath, spirit to spirit. Does that sound unreasonable? If we're going to contact him, it's got to be according to his terms, not God, why don't you just shout it? Why don't you just show? That isn't going to work. You get quieter. He doesn't get louder. You get quieter. And so what he was teaching me was how to get quiet. And basically how to contact me, spirit to spirit. And here's the way he first instructed me. And I might have been maybe a year and a half old in the Lord. But I'm, he's teaching me this process. And in the middle of the night, I would feel, and I don't know how to explain it, but I knew it was the presence of God, but it was so mild that you could dismiss it very easily. And it almost felt like a feather of His presence brushed across my spirit, and it just felt good. And I am a heavy sleeper. You shouldn't even talk to me until I've had coffee. You don't want to talk to me until I've had coffee. I don't know what you said until I've had coffee. <laughs> and I felt that little brush, and I would slide out of bed, and I would commune with God, and it would be some of the most glorious experience. But it was so mild that it could, 99 out of 100 times, you could ignore it. And God says, Element number one, I want you to be easily approachable spirit to spirit. And there was even times that he would wake me in the middle of the night, not so that I could lose sleep, but I think really just checking my obedience. And I even learned a trick that I am such a sound sleeper and I am not good at this, that I put my leg out from the side of the bed and I let gravity pull me up because I didn't feel like I had the strength to do it. I'm going to go, I'm going back to sleep. And that worked a little bit. And then I remember the time when I felt his presence in the middle of the night and I ignored it and just slept. And you know, that presence didn't come back for a long time. And you know what? For me, that was school. That wasn't, he wasn't being mean, but he was, he was teaching me a pattern of a principle about what it takes to be easily available to him spirit to spirit. And your flesh can override spirit. The flesh less against the spirit. It can do it so easily that it takes practice. So he said, before you plant the church, I'm going to plant in here element number one that you, it is easy for you to contact me spirit to spirit. And actually I was shocked after I was saved a few years. I'd run into pastors and everything and even leaders that I felt like, I don't know if they even know the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it's kind of, it was kind of scary to me. They knew the Word. They knew what ink on a page. But when I would feel, I don't feel life coming from it. And to this day, I hear people giving, me, giving testimonies of supernatural that to me were not supernatural. I didn't feel no life on it. Some of it was, some of it isn't. But it's almost like, do people, can they uh, hunger and thirst to be so sensitive to the Spirit that, that basically you can make those distinctions. It's called discernment, distinction, differentiate, make distinctions between that which is Spirit and that which is flesh. And we can even get into that sometime as to how you can develop that. But that's element number one, to be easily contacted. Dennis, I want you approachable, not from a mental point of view, but I want to approach you by my spirit. Because they that worship him must worship in spirit and in reality, or spirit and truth. And that word truth is reality. Worship me in spirit and reality, and that's spirit to spirit. The second element. And until I read uh, some writings of other preachers, I never ran into anybody that knew what I was talking about. Um, after probably the first year that I was a Christian, after I was filled with the Holy Spirit, I found it to be normative to not miss a move in another person's spirit. Does that sound intimidating? I don't know but I'd never heard anybody else talk about it, but for me it was everyday life. 
In other words, if Jennifer said, was sitting there, actually if she said nothing, which is even more difficult to discern. If she said nothing and I said something and it bothered her, and down in here in her gut she went, uh, I would feel the uh, There were times when I was a young preacher even, I would preach something and would feel a reaction from somebody in the audience and then rephrase to make sure what I said was scriptural or why did they get that reaction. Then again, it could just be a need in them. Uh, but I would be able to discern the source of their reaction. And if they spoke, it's even easier because it's out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. I could discern the nature that's attached to the words. Most of you have learned this same principle in a different way. You learned that, did you ever tell somebody about Jesus and felt like there was a wall while you were talking? That's what I'm talking about. That's a spiritual function. That's not an intellectual function. You're talking about Jesus and you feel, this is going nowhere. I'm hitting a wall. That's because their heart is closed to what you're saying. I don't want to hear it. My head might have to listen to it, but my heart doesn't want to be open to it. So they put up a wall, you feel that wall. Then is there ever a time you are telling somebody about Jesus or your testimony or whatever, and you felt like, you felt like the person you were talking to were almost like a vacuum cleaner, pulling the words out of you, making it easy? Which is what this congregation does for me. You make it easy to preach because you're open here. And you feel it flowing, that's because that person's spirit is open. And it got me in trouble at first though because I once, when I was in my 20s, I had a, had a, a, a Sunday school class that I was supposed to be in, but my friend was the guest speaker. So I went in the congregation with, with the uh, older adults rather than go to my Sunday school class. And the teacher came out with a smile. This is why Christians do this anyway. Dennis, you need to be in the class. Didn't that sound sweet? That's the way she said it. But down here, she was mad as a hornet. And I could feel the, I could feel the anger. She goes, Dennis, you need to be in your classroom. And I'd feel this. And I said, well, you don't have to be angry. <laughs> I'm not angry. Of course, then you get a manifestation when you put your finger on the button. All right. That discernment operated for me as a constant. And they were calling me a counselor, which to me, that still amazes me to this day. No, the only thing I did was if the heart didn't match the words, I'd, I would say something. Like, like if it felt like nails on a blackboard, I love my mother. <laughs> I'd go, maybe we ought to pray that through anyway. And I was getting a reputation as some marvelous counselor. All I was doing was taking care of the discrepancy. You're with their lips, they praise me, but their heart somewhere else. And God, matters of the heart, is the heart of the matter with God. He cares about this, not about how, how you made an excuse, or how you said it so sweet. I had a lot of sweet people tell me stuff that used to make my hair stand up in the back. <laughs> it would get a bad witness here and my whole body would tingle. I love you, Pastor, and I'm thinking they're trying. <laughs> they're at least making a positive confession, but by golly, there is no love in those words. They would like to just <laughs> me, but anyway. All right, so what's level number one? Is God wants to be, I want to be easily approachable. You, Dennis, and I want this approachableness spirit to spirit. I want it reality. I want a real relationship. The second, the second level is I want you to be highly sensitive so that the slightest movement doesn't go by unnoticed. And you know, most of you, you have the same equipment, so you can't say, oh, I don't have that what Dennis has. Oh, you have it. You probably haven't developed it. You have an anointing, and it abides within you. And it will teach you if you let it teach you like I let it teach me. So it's not just a gifting because this operates almost 100%. Gifts don't operate 100%. They operate in flashes of insight. 
But sensitivity to the spirit and a relationship can be a constant. Just like I said, in my concept of prayer, I have special time and all the time. People that go back up into their head have special time where they're spiritual and then they come out of prayer and go do their job. I have no concept of that whatsoever. Because he didn't leave. We are joined to each other. I am one spirit with him. I have special time and all the time. So prayer for me is being with someone. Yes, there's different kinds of prayer. It's all kinds of prayer. But it's all coming out of that relationship. So I read uh, Watchman Nee. And when I was spending time with other pastors and also uh, uh, Dick Iverson on the West Coast in his Bible school course, he said, discerning of spirits comes in flashes of insight like all the other gifts of the Spirit. You know, they don't operate constantly. You don't have a constant word of knowledge. You don't have constant prophecy. But he says, all of the gifts are flashes of insight. He said, except for discerning of spirits, for some it appears to be almost a constant. That got my attention because nobody talked like that. So I'm thinking Dick Iverson probably, never met him, probably had discerning of spirits, which I would have called, I can't tell when is it a flash of insight when I see or hear, and when is it an awareness that's constant. I don't even know how to dis distinguish between discerning a walk in the Spirit or the presence of God with discerning of spirits that is special. There is a difference. But for me, it's a constant. And when he said that, I then said, God, then what I'm doing that I was keeping to myself because it was weird enough I didn't want to tell anybody else until I heard other people talk about it, and they weren't. Then I read that where Dick Iverson said that in his Bible school course, and then I read Watchman Nee, and that changed my life. He said, a broken man, meaning a humble, not broken, bad shape. Broken meaning the outer shell of your flesh is, is broken enough to let the release of the anointing come out. He said, a broken man doesn't miss a move in another man's spirit. That would challenge some of us, wouldn't it? A broken man doesn't miss a move in another man's spirit. And God's telling me level two is, is to be aware of the slightest change and have it not go unnoticed. And after just applying that one simple principle, everything we teach, all the books we've written, is built on that relationship. It gets you out of that carnal reasoning mind out of the psychology of mind and get you to the more to the reality of heart experience, spirit experience. So element number one, are you challenged? Element number one, are you gonna are you gonna feel the slightest little, is that God calling me to pray? Are you gonna be able to slide out of bed and commune? Or is the flesh gonna win? Element number two. Are you going to be able to start trusting and practicing listening to your gut a little bit more than your head? How many times did you, have you made mistakes, really? And you, in hindsight, say, you know, I had a gut feeling about that. Huh? But you overrode the gut, and that was lesson that I had to learn. You don't override the gut, because logic will get in there, and you'll make a thousand reasons and the holiest one of all is, I don't want to judge. All right? When in reality, God's saying, I gave you the equipment to discern good and evil, right from wrong, do right, do good. And if it doesn't feel right, don't take it. If it causes confusion, don't receive it. God's not the author. All right? Element number three. I think the highly sensitive is hard enough, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Learning to go by the gut. But you know, I taught this in my first pastorate, and I used to see people, of course maybe they were getting bored with the message, who had their eyes closed. But you know what they were doing? They were learning to drink on the anointing that's on the sermon more than the actual words themselves. When you hear a person's testimony, 
It's not really a sermon, but it's something that changed their life that carries a permanent anointing. And when they talk about it, it would be good for you to listen to their testimony and drink it in because there's life on that and it's impartable. And then they're really giving you something that could change your life. It's not theory. Too much preaching is theory. Preaching needs to be out of your experience and out of your reality because that's what feeds the Spirit. When I was a young Christian, I had people, I was in my 20s preaching, and I had people in, the 50, in their 50 age bracket, and they were telling me it was too complicated. We don't understand what you're talking about. And I was ready to, to back away from that because I didn't want to hear that. That was intimidating, that they don't know what I'm talking about. You know? And God, told, God gave me a vision of a x-ray screen, like if he did it right here, and he did a black x-ray screen. He showed me big, big heads and itsy bitsy spirits. He said, I called you to preach to the spirit. Spirit to spirit, not educate their heads. And if their heads don't understand, have their heads ask themselves, come to me and ask me why I don't understand what he's talking about. That's inquiring of the Lord. And that was a hard one to get through because I'm 20-something and it was like, the flesh pressure is, I want to be like everybody else. But you know what? I don't want to die a copy of somebody else. If God made you an original. Why would you want to die a copy? Right? Be who God called you to be. You don't have to be like everybody else. But element number two being not missing a move in someone else's spirit you basically get to the point to where you teach them that if you're saying something and it's not right in here, it's not right. Teach them to discern themselves. Before they discern other people, discern yourself. Let the Word discern you first. It will make a distinction between flesh and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of your heart. But when your heart is at peace, your capacity to discern what's going on in a given room or individuals is clear. If your heart is clear, you can discern. Love, the love of God in you precedes peace. Peace precedes your perception in the spiritual realm. Element number three. And this is my prayer. Before I go be with Jesus, I want to see a congregation that will be challenged by element number three. Element number three does not come easy. Element number three is this broken and a contrite heart. This, this is the person that I'm going to look upon. This is the person who trembles at my word. They're going to be easily approachable. They're going to be highly sensitive. And here you go. They are ready for corporate life. Element number three, ready. They touch the spirit of the body and belong. In this day and age, it's I'm part of the bigger body of Christ. That's an excuse for fear of intimacy. God places the solitary in families, and He places a family mission. And the family mission, our home groups are not just going to be uh, spaghetti dinners. A home group is basically to promote the family vision. And this family vision is quite simple. You're hearing some of the more complicated stuff today. But the simple vision is we teach people how to deal with their issues <laughs> and how to die to an agenda which is idolatry. How to find the plans and the purposes for your life and not just some agenda that you have momentarily. One of the, one of the most common ones that there's an agenda if someone comes into any church, any local church, and goes, well, I'm just here for a season. What that means is I'm just here to see what I can get and see how it can promote me. Hmm? And then I'm on my way because I'm, I need to be, I'm a gift to the larger body. Those are just telltale signs. That doesn't mean that everybody who says that means it. Sometimes they're... Sometimes God's guiding and directing and they don't know it. And God will use whatever. He'll take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. And some of you don't go the easy way all the time. So, right? 
He would like to guide you like Jennifer and my mother with their eye. <laughs> Young married couples, when you get married and the guy says, can I go play basketball with the guys? Go. Don't go. <laughs> you have to learn these things. It's a whole new language. Go. No, no. You, you stay home. You have to get an interpreter. You have to use discernment. How did, when they said go, what did they feel like in here? Go was down here. Mm -hmm. If you felt punched when they said go, don't go. You're creating problems. All of you have felt pushed or pulled regardless of a person's uh, gesture or words. Correct? That is a capacity you all have as a believer, but many don't develop it. Many trust in this too much instead of trusting in their heart. Learn to trust in, 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 in the gut and you'll build a track record and you'll find out that God knows stuff you don't know and you're better off doing it His way. But when you're ready for corporate life, what happens is you'll say you belong to Kingdom Life Church or you belong to Morning Star or you belong to Church of God and Christ or whatever. When you are healthy, down here, you touch. This is what we try to do in the beginning of worship. Open up to one another. Pay attention to who's in the room. You touch the spirit. Just like God wants to touch you spirit to spirit, you are not grounded until you touch and say, this is, this is my DNA, this is my tribe. Uh, you can use all different terminology, uh, or you don't even have a way to explain it. I just know I'm supposed to be here. Even that knowing is coming from this knower, not that knower. You've, made, you've touched the spirit of the body and you just know. I, I believe Glenn knows. He belongs here. Because we've seen people come and go and he goes, well, I don't know about them coming and going, but I'm here. He said, maybe you've been preaching too many of those tomato patch sermons. <laughs> I used to preach. If tomatoes belong in tomato patches. Pumpkins belong in pumpkin patches. If this is a tomato patch and you're a pumpkin, get out of here. Go somewhere else. <laughs> he said, no wonder people leave. <laughs> I want you to be where God wants you to be, and I want you to be part of it. But you've got to be able to touch the spirit of, the, of, of that body. That's a sign of, of, of growth and maturity, and it's, and it's not to limit you in some way. That's, that's the panic. The panic is somehow, uh, if I become part of all these potato heads, and I'm just a potato head, and I become, we'll become mashed potatoes and no one will ever notice me. I will lose my identity in being a mashed potato. I'll never be a potato again. That's one fear. Or, this is the one I like, my gift and my talent, they're not promoting me. It could be hindered here. I better go find some place where I can go promote my gift and my talent more effectively. Then it becomes what? Your gift and your talent. Right? So, element number three is that they touch the spirit of the body and belong. I can remember the first time God ministered to me on that word belong. And it was a supernatural experience in God. And I kept saying the same thing over. It was like, it really launched ministry because it was, I belong. I am accepted in the beloved. And there was a supernatural experience of belonging. I belong, therefore I got a lot to give. See, then your giving is coming out of the right source because it's coming out of belonging. Being is more important than doing. I watched for years, I watched Christians struggle trying to do to be accepted rather than get a revelation of your acceptance and then do out of that acceptance. Being is always more important than doing. But many in insecurity try to do something to be something. No. Your doing needs to flow out of your becoming. You, you behold Him. You believe in Him. You become. And out of that becoming, you, you behold, you believe, you become, you belong, you have a lot to give. 
And when I say you have a lot to give, the you I'm talking about is not your flesh. I'm talking about the recreated human spirit, you, that is joined together with the Lord. The real you, the new creation you, is what gives. You don't give anything, and apart from Him, you can do nothing. Now, the fourth element... had to do with being easily edified. You know what edified means? Built up, strengthened. In other words, uh, we shared this a little bit before. To be easily edified, what I listen to, and I've heard some pretty shallow preaching in my day, but even in the shallow preaching, I'm attuned to what part of that had life on it. If you take a different attitude, I already knew that, I already heard that, then there's a hardness that's already starting to develop over your heart. And you're not receiving the spirit of the teaching. You're going by, I already heard that once. Well, I could say, I already read the Bible once. What am I reading it again for? I already knew that. That's a telltale sign. Whenever you say, I already knew that, you're already treading on something. Because God says if you did the spirit of the teaching and you're easily edified, you can take what you already knew and go deeper, trust me. Hmm? I saw that little thing on Facebook about the atheist challenging the Christian. You have 15 minutes. Anybody see that? It's kind of cute. He said, I can do it in two minutes. And his argument was this, basically. The atheist doesn't believe in God, of course, feels it's ridiculous. So he drew a circle. And he says, this is the Christian, drew a circle and said, let's assume that all knowledge is in that circle. And you're a brilliant, you're a brilliant scholar. I think it was at Cambridge. And he said, you're a brilliant scholar. Out of all the knowledge contained in that circle, how much do you know? Well, he chunked off about an eighth of the circle. <laughs> he said, well, you're an intelligent man. <laughs> he says, but this other part of the circle is what you don't know. Do you agree? And he goes, right, I don't agree. He said, then you're not an atheist. You're probably an agnostic, and you're almost on your way to getting to know my Jesus. <laughs> he admitted he didn't know. <clears throat> Out of the whole of knowledge... This is for the cerebral people. Out of the whole of knowledge, there's a huge portion you don't know. Most people that reject God are rejecting someone that they never introduced themselves to in the first place. You don't know what you're rejecting. You never accepted him. Accept him and then reject him. I mean, not that I want you to do that, but at least you'd know what you were rejecting. One who is not yielded can hardly be edified. So what basically, do you think Jesus was anointed? There was people that didn't receive. His faith is a condition of the heart. And their hearts were closed toward him, so they couldn't receive the most anointed person that ever walked the earth in the flesh. They couldn't receive because their heart was closed. A person who is unyielded, who does not know how to yield from the heart, doesn't get edified. You can't edify when the edification is a process of spirit to spirit. So the next time you're listening, you listen with your spirit, not just your head. And you will find there's life on certain things being spoken and as you get more and more sensitive, God will speak through creation if he needs to. Basically, if you're sensitive, you receive from the heart and you become easily edified and you begin to literally read the word. And I'm going to close with this because I've taught this before and I'm going to teach it over and over and over again. There's three ways to read in the spirit. The first one is when you read the Word, you, re you can read that Word for content so you get understanding, right? 
but to really read the way the Lord taught me was to get into a portion of Scripture that reveals His character and His nature and stay there till I meet the reality of Him. All things are naked and open to the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. So the Word is living, it's powerful, but it's not just ink on a page, is it? It's a person. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Stay on that Scripture till you feel the life that it has in it. And if it's quickened life, then absorb it. Feed on it. And God will expand and decree and declare things that you never would have thought of in your own mind by reason. And you get edified, you get built up, you become, you get a greater portion or a partaker of the divine nature and a residue of that nature remains in you forever. Isn't that a better way to read? The second way to read is read what's going on in you at any given moment. And next week we're going to have fun. We're going to have a test next week. And you're going to be able to practice it all week. So I, want to, I don't want to tell you what it is now. But this is our fun. And it's a test that basically God gave me and I still love to use it. And you can memorize it. It's just five little steps. And you just, at the end of the day, you just check yourself out and see how you did. But this ability to just hold the heart open and be easily, easily edified. And just welcoming His presence, yielded and easily edified so that I can do even like, uh, like Jennifer. I had, to, I had to see where I needed to yield was in traffic. Anybody have to yield in traffic a little bit? You're not real proud of the way you behave in traffic. And I just love Jennifer says, Dennis, the road is a... Microcosm, macro, microcosm of the kingdom. It's God's kingdom. And he placed those people on the road exactly where he wanted to. And he's allowing you to see what's in your heart toward those people on the road. All right, all right, all right. That was the shortest sermon, the most convicting sermon. I don't need an explanation. I got it. All right, I got it. But when someone would cut us off in the road, I have a tendency to get uh, frightened and defensive. Jennifer goes, somebody cuts in front of her and she goes, oh, Jesus, let's just let love will flow out to that person to keep them safe all the way home. I'm going, I was thinking about, I was thinking about me. <laughs> She's thinking about the safety of that person. I'm going, that's the heart of God. That takes practice. That comes by reason of use. <laughs> that does not flow naturally from your head. <laughs> huh? Your head doesn't think that way. But God wants us to be easily edified to where we can see what's going on in us. What are our reactions? Let God start looking at all of your negative reactions. And this, this is where we got a reputation as counselors. I hate that because we're not counselors. What we taught people is how to deal with their stuff. Toxic emotions are an indication. Jesus isn't ruling right now. I mean, we should be able to teach this to third graders, right? Less than that. Five-year-olds get this quick. If you're angry, Jesus isn't ruling right now. If you're fearful, Jesus isn't ruling right now. If you're hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame, Jesus isn't ruling in that. Learn to read what's going on in yourself. The most heartbreaking experience I've had when we traveled to churches was praying for someone and I'm starting to cry based on the hurt, and I'm only picking up the tip of the iceberg of what's going on in them. Discernment only feels a slight shadow of what's going on in them. And if I'm almost crying over the pain in somebody, and that person, I go, what do you feel down here? I don't know. I ain't had a feeling since 1927. They have a responsibility to know what's going on in them. God's going to hold them accountable. So you just can't buy off. I suppress everything. I don't feel. I, I don't have feelings. Yeah, you're a time bomb going somewhere to happen. 
because God made you a thinking, feeling, choosing being, and He wants to corral every loose thought, every loose feeling, and every loose impulse into a life that's shaped by Jesus. But He needs all three of those. So you better learn how to read what's going on inside. The third level of how to read, and I'm reading it right now, some of you are getting tired, just a long sermon. The third level is to read what's going on in your environment. But you're also wide open. What's going on in your environment? If you walk in, have you ever walked into a room and felt pressure and nobody's talking? It's good to pay attention. You read that, you can accommodate it properly. If you feel tension in the room, that could be an opportunity for you to minister redemptively. Okay, ladies, we got some that are going to be getting married shortly. I know Heather had to go, but I'm going to, I'm going to talk about some of the things that they can learn to teach their men. If the woman, don't close your ears now, over here. We'll use Krista. If Krista's standing at the sink, they're getting married in June. If Krista's standing at the sink and she's feeling bad in her spirit, I'd like to see the man that while her back is turned and she's not saying a word, say, honey, is there something wrong? That'd be good, wouldn't it? Wouldn't you love that, honey? I remember Jason, you said, so when this is back in the day, Jason would say something like to a girl, how are you? Okay. I'm okay. How are you really? Right, ladies? That'd be better. How are you really? <laughs> like that. Come on. Come on, men. You're going to have to... It, you're going to have to understand these women better. That's all there is to it. The two come to be, become one. You've got to understand them. And it's a mystery. But you have the equipment to learn and discover. Hmm? One more example, then I'm going to nail the men here real good. I would teach the young pastors to take their wife shopping and say, honey, you can have anything you want. I had the one pastor say, I'm not ready for that yet. <laughs> but if you are, they will not abuse you. You cultivate a deep, implicit trust in the relationship. So I had him call up and he was bragging on himself. He said, I took her shopping and I went to dinner. And I said, you did good. You took her shopping and went, took her to dinner. That's great. Mm -hmm. But that's not the best part. He said, she picked up a white blouse and a blue blouse and held them up and said, honey, which one can I have? And he said, get them both. He said, that was really hard to do. <laughs> but he had to call up and brag that he did it. And you know what she did? Oh, honey, I don't need both of them. I'll just take the white one. I said, see, that's building a relationship based on bonds of love and trust and not abusing one another. You love one another, not abuse one another. And those kind of things will take place. Ready? We'll save some for next week. Next week's the test. So, Father, we just thank you that you who began a good work are going to continue that good work. Your cause is going to be spiritual giants in the days ahead. We're going to be sensitive to your presence. We're going to have a, 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 a wonderful experience in the oneness of God here in Kingdom Life Church. We're going to welcome that. And if you're watching by Ustream, you're participating because there's no distance in the spirit. And we're going to be, we're just going to be knit together and we're going to touch the corporate body and we're going to draw out of that body because there is, there is anointing in the cluster. And we're drawing on an anointing that's not just Dennis, it's not just Jennifer, it's not just one person. We're going to draw on that anointing that's in the cluster. And even now, we're receiving healing to our physical bodies. We're getting, we're getting um, 
Uh, we're getting emotional healing just by listening, and all of a sudden peace is coming and encompassing me all about. And so, Father, I just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.